I want to start by thanking Walter Edwards and the Humanity Center, whom I'm, I'm proud to call a, a friend. The Humanity Center, of course, is such a wonderful resource and intellectual home for so many of us here. And, um, and uh, thank you, Walter, for this opportunity to, to present the project and for your support of the project as well. One thing I've learned is that making a film, I'm new to this, I've learned pretty quickly that making a film is not something that you do by yourself, or at least it's not something that I could do by myself. And uh, I've been really fortunate to have the help of so many people, um, some people who I think I may um, whose faces I don't know yet, but may be here and I'm looking forward to meeting that have been helping with uh, transcription of interviews and translations. Um, my Ecuador film crew, Chris Ray and, and uh, Nathan Maisie are here. Why don't you guys let yourselves be, be known. <laughs> they, they've uh, a, a great crew to travel together in Ecuador and um, good sports under conditions uh, sometimes involving sleeping on floors and tables. <laughs> um, I don't see the person who I guess I can only call sort of my angel in this project, Gary Sandrowski here, but I'd like to recognize him too. He was, he's been really instrumental in, in supporting the project and um, you know, a, number of, a number of other people. Thank you all for, for coming. It's really a delight to see so many people come for a talk on, on an issue that um, not enough people care about. So the context for my thinking about this project is that I I came to understand about 10 years ago that climate change is an urgent and important issue. But, of course, the governments of the world and the government of the United States have not been doing enough about it. The U.S. government made some progress under the Obama administration in addressing the issue. Nowhere near enough, mostly through executive action, not laws because of the problems with the Congress. The current administration, as you probably all are aware, is doing everything it can to undermine the progress that's been made. And there are a lot of reasons for this political failure. I could give a, a complex answer. Oops. But one simple part of the answer is that most Americans just don't care enough about the issue, about climate change. That goes even for Democrats, but it especially goes for Republicans. Only a small minority of Republicans name climate change as something that they care a great deal about. And this has been the crux of the political problem for the last decade and more. In particular, especially the last decade. Uh, only 20% of, of Republicans say that it's a very serious problem. I think I already said that, mentioned that. Only 15% of conservative Republicans say that climate change is due to human activity. 35, or 34% of moderate or liberal Republicans, I didn't know that there are any liberal Republicans <laughs> left, but that's the, the polling category anyway. Um, now that Republicans control the presidency in both houses of Congress, it's of course all the more important to make climate action a priority for Republicans as well as Democrats, to find some way of reaching uh, Republicans as well. And what does this have to do with evangelicals? Well, about one in four U.S. voters are, evangelic are, are white evangelical Christians. They overwhelmingly vote Republican, about 80%, which is a much higher percent than any other religious racial demographic group that the pollsters you know, separate out, uh, except Mormons. And this makes them about 40% of the Republican 
constituency, the Republican electorate. So about two in uh, about two in five Republican voters are evangelical, are white evangelical Christians, and so it's an extremely important part of the Republican constituency. They're much less likely than any other religious, racial, demographic group to believe that global warming is happening and that it's due to human activity. Only about 28% by this, by this poll. Now, I'm not assuming that religious differences or religious beliefs necessarily cause these differences in opinions on climate change. Scholars debate the significance or the influence of religious beliefs. It's certainly not the case that evangelical theology necessarily leads to climate denial or to politically conservative beliefs generally. So for example, in Canada, the politics of religion are very different, just over the border. Canadian evangelicals have generally not been you know, a reliably right-wing constituency, certainly not, not as right-wing as, as uh, U.S. evangelicals. Uh, Lydia Bean is a, a sociologist. I think she comes out of a Canadian evangelical background. And in this book, she describes some specific historical and social processes that have led many evangelicals in the United States to believe that you can't be a good Christian if you accept what they regard as liberal beliefs. So even though you can't draw a straight line from theology to climate denial, the implication to me is that for U.S. evangelicals, there does seem to be a connection to religious identity. Right? If they believe you can't be a good Christian and believe in climate change. So climate change communication that addresses the cultural and religious identity of evangelicals could be an important part of strategies to shift public opinion and ultimately to overcome this partisan polarization that I started off talking about. There's very little in films and media and environmentalist communication generally that's designed to reach evangelical Christians. There is some basis for, there, there are some, some values, some evangelical values, aspects of evangelical religious identity that climate communication can draw on. One is the biblical passages that call on people to be good stewards of God's creation. And there are some evangelical organizations that have taken up this, this call and advocate excuse me, for addressing climate change. Um, this is a screenshot of the website of one uh, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, or YECA, and um, this guy in the middle here, uh, Kyle Mayer Schaub, um, he's their current leader. He comes out of the Christian Reformed Church in Western Michigan. He lives in Ann Arbor now, and he's one of the people that I've learned a lot from. And, just talking with him about this project and, and developing it. Um, very, very thoughtful guy. He's representative of a younger generation of evangelicals of whom many see social justice as a central aspect of being Christian. Part of Yekka's inspiration, Young, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, is the biblical mandate to love your neighbor and to care for the least of these. These are New Testament passages. So if you recognize, or if they, once they recognize that climate change affects the poor and marginalized, as they put it, I think, in, in their call to action, it affects the poor and marginalized the, the most, um, although they have contributed the least to the problem, right? poor and marginalized people in the world have pretty low emissions compared to the wealthy people in wealthy countries. So once you realize that, it's not only an issue of um, you know, sustainability, it's an issue of justice as well. So 
people like like Kyle and Young Evangelicals for Climate Action are moved by that kind of um, realization. Um, Kyle and others tell me that beyond the activists, younger evangelicals generally are more responsive to messages that emphasize the plight of poor people in other countries than the older and more conservative evangelicals are. The, the older constituency, less so. Um, which is not to say nobody among older generations are. So these are two other early supporters of this project. Uh, uh, Nathan and I filmed both of them in the spring. Another important thing to understand about evangelicals is that the idea, and I suppose Christians generally, but evangelicals in particular, the idea of loving your neighbor and caring for, as I said, the, the least of these, has long led many evangelicals to give generously, to donate money generously to relief and development organizations working in the global south. Several of the largest American relief and development organizations are um, evangelical. The, the largest is measured by their, by their budgets. And some of these organizations recognize that climate change is undermining the work that they do or bringing them new challenges, like hurricanes in the Caribbean. Right? They recognize the, the connection, although some of them are reticent to talk about it to their evangelical U.S. Kind of donor base. Um, so they're, they're, they have sort of a dilemma about that, but they, many of the leaders recognize it. Um, Joanne Lyon founded one of the, not one of the larger uh, relief and development organizations, but the one, one that's affiliated with the Wesleyan Church, uh, called World Hope International. Her son, is, John Lyon, is now the CEO of this organization. And Joanne tells a story of meeting a woman in Zambia through her work with World Hope International. She met this woman who was scratching out a living on a farm and was having a real hard time of it because of drought. And she says when she was watching this woman and hearing about how she was going to have to forage in the bush for food because of the way her her farmland was just baked dry. That's when she said to herself, she said, um, if I want to love my neighbor, I have to care about climate change. So more broadly, this connection that evangelicals feel to poor people in the global south through their support of relief and development organizations may be something that climate communication aimed at evangelicals can, can build on. Of course, there's another type of connection to the Global South, too, and, and, or, or to what evangelicals would call the mission field. Right? Anthropologists traditionally tend to be pretty ambivalent about missionary work, but that's beside the point uh, for, for, for this, these purposes. Um, and I'll, I'll return to that missionary connection a little bit later. Another evangelical organization that's been active in advocating for climate action is the Evangelical Environmental Network. They're actually the parent organization of YECA. Um, but their leaders, and Mitch Hescox in particular, uh, focuses more on that older, more conservative evangelical segment. Mitch Hescox himself describes himself as politically conservative. And so he's really aiming at the sort of um, harder core in the sense of, you know, difficult to reach with a climate change message. My initial idea for this film project was to focus only on the Global South and build on that connection that I talked about. Mitch and Kyle as well actually encouraged me to pair stories from the Global South with US stories. One reason for this, besides that, just that sense of greater connection or identification with, with Americans, is to avoid the tendency that we all have to talk and think about climate change as just a distant problem. 
it's very easy for all of us to fall into this, partly because it's kind of an overwhelming and difficult and scary problem, so we distance it. Studies of climate change communication, climate change psychology, like um, George Marshall's book, also caution against this. So the long-term strategy, or the current plan for this project, is to pair places from the Global South and places in the United States that face similar effects from climate change. So for example, the Marshall Islands and Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, both are very vulnerable to sea level rise. In the Marshall Islands, there's a, a very strong presence of Pentecostal Christians and other evangelicals and missionaries also. Most of the people who live on Tangier Island are very conservative um, evangelical Christians, Methodists. So the plan is to explore a range of views among local evangelicals in these places, among missionary and development workers also, who might help to sort of make that bridge to an American audience, and to kind of put these different voices and perspectives in dialogue with each other as a way of trying to broaden the conversation among American evangelicals. I'm thinking even of filming them responding to each other's views and experiences and perspectives. The Global South cases are important for showing the effects of climate change among the least of these and for emphasizing that climate change is a social justice issue for those evangelicals who are responsive to that kind of appeal. It's important also, as I said, as a way of broadening the conversation, showing evangelicals in this country that you can be a good Christian and recognize that climate change is an important issue that the world needs to address. Many evangel I mean, the, 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 the politics of, ev of evangelicalism and climate change in the U.S., as I suggested, is, is particular to the U.S. In other places, such as we found in Ecuador this summer, you know, many evangelicals don't have any problem recognizing that, that uh, not only is it an important issue, but it's an important issue for them as Christians to address. The U.S. cases are important for showing that it's not just in faraway places that climate change is having uh, severe effects, but also in the U.S. Um, and in fact, that it's affecting people that even conservative white evangelicals can easily regard as people like us. So we started filming in Ecuador during three weeks this summer. Ecuador is not one of the countries in the world that's most severely vulnerable to climate change. It's a middle income country, probably you know, around the middle of the range in terms of vulnerability to climate change. Within Ecuador, the province where I have worked for many years is one of the more vulnerable provinces. Um, it's a relatively poor area, uh, high concentration of quechua speaking indigenous people. I chose Ecuador as a place to start the filming and to sort of produce a, a proof of concept piece because it's a place that I know well and I have lots of connections and you know, it's just easier to, to start there. Can you all read the font in the back? So, well, this is this is just part of a, a potential pitch to American evangelicals for this segment. I'll have to see what my evangelical consultants um, think of it and how it how it comes off. But it's basically building on this sense of connection. So, f 50 years ago, missionaries from the United States and Canada brought the gospel to Quechua-speaking indigenous people in Ecuador. 
now some of the first converts and their children have a message for their Christian brothers and sisters in the United States. Um, these files are all raw, unedited footage, and so they're, they're pretty large files. Some of them, oops, I didn't mean to, to do that. Let me see if I can find the, the other arrow. Oops, oh, that, So uh, bear with me if some of the files take a long time to, to load. So this is just a, a part of the province that's kind of the capital of the, evangel of the indigenous evangelical movement in, in the province and really in the whole of Ecuador. It was a place uh, by the side of this lake where North American missionaries lived for decades and decades. And um, Kichwa speaking indigenous people started to convert en masse to uh, evangelical Protestantism in the 1960s. The missionaries left some decades ago. Oh, is that a... Here we go. Uh, let's see, so I don't need to just... Right so, uh, the evangelicals Basically, uh, the indigenous evangelicals run their own show now. Let me lower the volume a little bit. They have their own pastors, their own leadership, their own politics, importantly, too. They've, they've changed from their initial kind of very conservative political orientation. Um, and, uh, you know, basically they're fully autonomous. The pastor in this particular church who invited us to spend a couple days in, in his community um, is very, very aware, very um, keen to protect creation. As we would put it. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, open up a different file. I had to. I broke this up into a number of different PowerPoint files because they were so large. So it may take a little while to, to load. Oh no, that's good. Let's see, let me see. Uh, no, so it's taking a little while to load. <laughs> um, but once it comes up, I'll show you a few a few moments of this clip. Um, this is a a man that I'm going to show you is uh, one of the first converts to evangelical. Protestantism in the con in the in the uh, province. He was a, his guy in his 80s. There we go. And uh, let me see. Let me start this uh, a little bit. Uh, this interview is in Kishma. Um He converted sometime in the early 1960s. One of the first converts uh, in his village, he persisted in the faith, in the face of death threats from his family, from the priests. And these, these people were all Catholics before. And we filmed him in his plot, a little plot next to his house, where he showed us how his fava beans, those are fava beans in the background, they should be green, and they should have fava beans in the pods, and they're all just dry and brown and rotted, because it rained in excess this year. The last couple of years, it's just rained and rained and rained, and it continued to rain even past the time when normally it would stop raining. In Ecuador, 
Up until a couple of decades ago, it ranged from, well, in this province, from about um, September to May or early June, and then it would stop raining. We were there for three weeks in July, and it drizzled at least part of the day, about half the days that we were there. So it was still it was still raining, and then the excessive rains here were followed by three days of, of uh, very heavy frost. And so he's he's showing that, and he's um, he went on to say, you know, this is not the way it was when I was a kid. <laughs> this is not the weather that we used to have. I asked him why. You know, why does he? What does he think has happened? Well, you know, everybody knows. Everybody talks about it. it's climate change, and why is climate change happening? Well, because people are are polluting the atmosphere. It's pretty clear and straightforward to him. And uh, what message do you it's want to send? It's one o'clock. <laughs> I have my computer set up to do that to remind me of my office. I, I, I don't remember how to turn that off. <laughs> um, so what message do you want to send to people in the United States? Well, I hope that uh, people act on climate change. So we just kind of lucked into this guy the last day we were there walking around this community. This, this is actually in that central, that village that was sort of the center and the start of the evangelical movement in, in Ecuador. So um, I think that should give him a little bit of credibility in the eyes of American evangelical audiences. Close up shot of the, the fava beans. We filmed in his field and we walked around the village and you know just whole fields were just black with and, and, and rotting like that. The fava beans in particular, some of the other crops were also, were also harmed. This is a, another guy in, um, in the valley where I did my field work uh, for my dissertation 25 years ago. There's one, one village that's evangelical. And uh, this guy is harvesting a few tiny potatoes. It doesn't even look like a potato field. If you've ever been in a potato field, you know it doesn't look like little tufts of grass. What you're seeing is, is grass growing there, more than potato plants. Uh, again, because of too much rain this year. Are the small potatoes very tiny? There's, some, there's a few really, really tiny potatoes. We have a, a lot more footage of that, but, you know, I mean, sometimes he'll, he'll put the hoe into the ground and there's nothing. Sometimes he'll find one or two. Um, and, and there's, a, I guess it's not this footage, there, there's another footage where he, you know, he, he shows what the potato plants look like and it's like, you know, a little, a little stick or something because it just didn't develop because of the rain. Um, so the climate in, this part of Ecuador, as in so much of the world, has become a lot more unpredictable. Which, that's the basic problem for, for farmers. We found several ways that people are responding to that new unpredictability. Some people are changing their planting schedule. So in some villages people tell us, well, you know, now we plant any time of year because it might rain any time of year. There's no demarcated dependable dry season and rainy season. Uh, some people, a lot of people I think, are, are using more pesticides to kind of ward off the, the fungal diseases that come with too much rain. That's of course costly, and whatever strategy you take, there's just more risk. You can't, you can't get away from the, from the risk. Uh, so now let me pull up the third aisle. Um, I'm still spinning. I don't have time to show you. What time is it actually? Okay. So I don't have time to show you all of the places where we filmed and all of the stories. 
But I did want to show also this evangelical community. I should back up and say that in many parts of the province, uh, I mean, there are some villages which are you know, half evangelical and half Catholic, but often what you find is that a whole village, you know, once one person or one family starts to convert, um, villages convert to evangelicalism sort of as a community, as a village. In some cases they convert back to, to Catholicism as a village. Um, this is one place, it's a village called Chorrera Mirador, uh, high on the slopes of Mount Chimborazo, which uh, we'll, we'll turn around the camera in a moment and, and show you that. But it's a, it's a community that's responding constructively to climate change in a really interesting way. That's wind. So the water from the glacier of Mount Chimborazo, which you saw in the first few moments of this of this clip, supplies the water from the whole water for the whole province. A lot of the water for the whole province comes from, from the glacier of the mountain. Including the capital city of Riobamba, which is Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, oh, that's, sorry, that's my, that's the next slide. So, the water comes down from the glacier, the, the, the melt water. And in a few moments, we should be able to see, looking way down into the valley below, somewhere down here. Well, I, we have another shot with a close-up, but it's this. There we go. Okay. This, this, this city here is the capital of the province called Riobamba. So this is, this is a big part of the water supply. The glacial ice has been noticeably retreating. So that means there's less, and there's, there's going to be less water um, for, the, for the whole province. Now these high mountain grasslands or more lands, also are important in the water supply. They act as sort of a sponge that stores water and then releases it. So as the glacier recedes, this function of the grasslands becomes all the more important. In many places, this is not Georgia de Mirador now, people set fire to the grass because the sheep and cattle can't eat this, uh, they, they eat this sort of, this more tender young shoots, but the older grass uh, is too tough for the sheep. So people burn it off, so then the grass... Car passing, I think. So they burn off the grass. Here you see these whole hillsides um, that people set fire to so that the grass will reshoot. And you know, I don't know if they meant to, build the, to, to burn the whole mountainside. Sometimes once a fire gets going, it's hard to stop. So this practice of burning the grasslands really damages the, the, that ecological function or damages the, the capacity of the grass to store water. And many places have seen a decline in the water flow, in the flow of water for irrigation and for other, for other uses. Sheep and cattle are destructive to the grasslands, the moorlands, in other ways too. Their hooves are very 
hard. They, the, the way that they eat the grass is, is damaging. On to the next file. In Chorjeda Mirador, what will come up in a few moments, uh, working with the government and with some NGOs, the community agreed not to have cattle or sheep above a certain line. The government, in fact, has a, has a project all around the, the glacier to sort of protect the environment, and they, they've reintroduced or introduced um, wild vicuñas there. But also, but people do use that pasture land, and I'll show you how in a few moments. These are all such big files that they just tax the memory of the computer. What is the, you said they reintroduced wild vicuñas? Uh, vicuñas, vicuñas are a camelid, like a uh, relative of, of llamas and uh, alpacas. So one of these lines in the, in the hill here is, they, is sort of the limit of where they graze uh, cattle and sheep. And above that line, yeah, they might have already. reintroduced alpacas, which make a really beautiful sound. I want you to, to hear their bleeding. It's just really cool. So um, they have a herd of uh, a, a cooperative in the village of, uh, I think, 24 families. And they take care of these, of these alpacas. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Redo this. Do my lens. Oh, maybe. I, I'm gonna pull out. It's just gonna be a wide. No, no, you can't tell. I thought I maybe, maybe I must have loaded the wrong file into this, but anyway. Well, you you, you see a little bit of. He's taking the, the alpacas up to pasture. And uh, this community, as a result of taking care of the moorlands, of not having sheep up there and not burning off the, the grasslands, they've seen some recovery of their water flow. There are some other issues involved in this, too. There are some social justice issues, because despite 
what they see as their role as protectors of it, they don't actually have the rights to use all of that water. There's a cement factory at the base of the valley that, that um, got, a, got the rights to use a, a, a big portion of it. So there's, there's issues there. But okay, so let me go on to the next file, I think. Maybe the last one. So, in addition to just, I mean, substituting for, for um, sheep, the alpacas, uh, their wool is, is really fine wool. It's not itchy like sheep's wool is, and it has a high value in international markets even. Um, they're also um, using it as a basis for another supplementary source of income. The women are knitting um, caps and scarves and stuff like that. In fact, I brought back a few to use as, as um, perks for people who donate to the film project. Um, so I, I was just gonna, I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, and then. Oh, so when we were there the first day, um, a guy, this guy stopped uh, and he wanted to buy, he, he actually wanted to order a sweater to be knit to his specifications. So that's what they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, how he wants the sweater made. So I want to just kind of wrap up by talking about some general principles that I'm trying to follow in this project, principles that I think are important um, for the project to be successful. And the first, maybe it seemed obvious, but it's not always practice, is to respect and speak to the audience's values and their sacred symbols and their, their identities. That should come through in a lot of ways. In this project, I have evangelicals speaking to other evangelicals in a common language that they share, the language of scripture and um, a framing of, of God's creation, that this is what it's about. It's not about something separate from us, the environment. It's not just a secular issue, but it's, it's God's creation. A basic principle, kind of going along with that, of, of climate communication generally, is that people respond to messengers that they trust. So we certainly tried to film, and we filmed some pastors, we filmed other evangelicals. The focus of the, of the film itself is evangelicals. So it's really evangelicals talking to other evangelicals through the medium of other evangelicals who, who are advocating through creation care. I, I, this, the aim of this project is partly to create a tool that people like Kyle Manshop and Young Evangelicals for Climate Action can use in speaking with other evangelicals. Um, it's important, of course, to respect the subject's intelligence and knowledge, and the audience's intelligence and knowledge, and that um, has several implications. One, I think, is to acknowledge the, what people know themselves about their environment, even if even the evangelicals who don't believe in climate change, right? I I I don't want to um, come off in the film as sort of saying they don't know anything, right? They know a lot about their own environment and what's happening to them. They may not 
make the connections that climate scientists make. They, they, they may not have that perspective, but, but I don't want to just sort of imply that they don't know anything. Also, I think audiences will, will smell a fish if they see me oversimplifying the science. So, for example, I've just learned recently that um, it's not entirely clear what will happen to Pacific Islands as sea level rises. Right? There's some evidence or some science that indicates that islands naturally sort of migrate and sand might be, can be deposited and they might be built up. The problem seems to be, in particular, where islands are already built upon and you know you can't just pick up and move the 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 asphalt and all of the houses and all of that but it's important not to oversimplify and also to to convey some of the diversity of perspectives again i think audiences will smell a fish if i'm just presenting one perspective so i, I really want to want the film to show kind of an open dialogue not just one you know not not just substitute one dominant uh, perspective for, for another dominant perspective in terms of what I show in the film. A basic principle of filmmaking generally, of course, and communication generally, is that people respond to narratives, to stories. I, I'm aiming at getting stories that have some human depth and complexity and not, not just you know, a quick sound bite of someone saying, yes, protect God's creation, but really stories that people can empathize with, and stories also that have some sort of dramatic tension. And that's one of the challenges of this project, is to figure out where I can find that dramatic tension. I have some ideas about that, but um, that's another important thing. Uh, oh, I guess there's just an extra space in here. Uh, Something really important for climate change communication is not to overwhelm people with how, how terrible it is. It's very easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged and kind of paralyzed by, by terror. And the fact is that there is hope and that there are people doing some constructive things. And uh, I think people need to see that um, so that they can also, uh, oh, I see what happens. So for some reason, the, so my first example of that was, is what's blacked out for some reason, but um, showing people acting, so showing people responding in ways such as the El Papa project, so that I'm not presenting people just as victims, but also as, as agents, people who can respond. And for the audience also, um, you know, it's important not to let them, not to have them walk away with, wow, I should do something, now what do I do, who knows? But to actually direct them to people that they can identify with, to the evangelical creation care organizations for guidance in how to respond constructively within their own cultural framework. Finally, people confront crises, people respond to crises, um, or at least they, they confront them and respond best, not as isolated individuals, but as members of communities. So part of the distribution plan for this project, again, is to do it through these evangelical creation care advocates who go to churches. And they might show a, you know, a, a segment of this project, a film from this project, and use that as a basis for a Bible discussion, for example, in the church. Um, so people don't, you know, don't, 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 aren't left sort of agonizing at home just about you know, how they can confront this overwhelming problem. Okay, I didn't want to let the opportunity go by without, uh, without inviting your help and your participation. Uh, as I said at the beginning, making a film is not something that you do by yourself. 
And I, I have um, about a dozen people helping me transcribe some of the interviews in, in Spanish and translating, but I can always use more help. I have a couple of interviews in English that aren't transcribed yet. Um, if anybody knows Kichwa, I welcome the volunteers for that, but probably I'm going to be transcribing that, those ones myself. Um, I can always use help with fundraising and social media. Uh, I don't have a website up yet, but, I, but that's one of the plans. Um, I'm still researching potential film locations. Where are there evangelicals? What kind of, what's going on in these places in terms of climate change? Uh, it, there's, there's a lot of administrative and logistical things to do, so if anybody's really good with kind of organizing and logistics, which I'm not, uh, I welcome that help. If anybody has a, a graphic design talent, films need logos and you know, design. Um, scholarly collaborations, too. I'm you know, definitely open, open to that. Or if anybody just wants to follow the project and get updates, uh, I have a sheet here. Please <laughs> sign up, and I'll and I'll keep you posted as the film uh, progresses. So uh, I'll just get a couple of or all these sheets going around. Oops. So thank you all for coming, and um, I am here to hear your uh, comments, questions, feedback. Um, what other countries are you looking at? So um, uh, I mentioned, of uh, Ecuador was first. Uh, Marshall Islands is a possibility. Um, alternatively, maybe uh, Tuvalu is another Pacific island with with uh, similar. Um, similar issues. Um, the Philippines is similarly very vulnerable to sea level rise and also to, to uh, tropical cyclones. And um, actually the president of the World Evangelical Association um, is from the Philippines and he has been very outspoken about climate change. So that's another place. Um, I'm thinking about Possibly, so one, so one of the countries in the East African highlands, maybe Rwanda, because my department has some connections to Rwanda, but that's an area where there seems to be pretty strong evidence that um, malaria is climbing up the slopes because of climate change. It's expanding its range. Um, and then um, Sierra Leone is another country I'm thinking about. Joanne and John Lyon and their organization have a lot of connections there. They, they, they work there, so I'm thinking that, you know, that might be a good place to go to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd describe the, um, the film that might result from this. Is it a feature length? Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a question that sense we're sense still that. trying to figure out the answer to. Um, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, and Kyle seems to be most interested in having really short clips that young people can share on social media. And I can definitely see some short clips like that coming out of this. Um, Mitch Hescox, of, who, who works with the older people and, and, and some other people, um, are more interested in having like um, around 15 minute pieces that they can show in churches and use as a basis, excuse me, for, for discussions. Um, Joanne Lyon also encouraged me to think about um, uh, TV, television broadcast, or even feature film length. So the way that we're thinking about it now is that there's lots of pieces that we may be able to, well, and, and a series is another possibility that we've, we've talked about. Um, there's lots of pieces that may be standalone pieces, but may also be assemblable into larger pieces. So I, I guess I'm avoiding, at this point, avoiding choosing because there seems to be a use for lots of different lengths. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. My was just be like, what's, what's the huge difference between, I guess, evangelical Christians and Baptists and whatnot? Like, what's so special about evangelicals? And is, is their response better to climate change than everybody else? Well, so several things. Um, I guess let me first clarify. Evangelical is a cross-denominational category. It's been defined in different ways. Um, the largest evangelical denomination is the Southern Baptists. Um, there are other denominations that some people within those denominations will call themselves evangelicals and others will not. Um, and there are different, again, different ways that it's been defined. Um, but what's special about evangelicals from the point of view of this project is just that there isn't a lot of environmentalist communication that's designed to reach them, and they haven't been reached and haven't, white evangelicals in particular, and it's different for Hispanic or black evangelicals, but um, white evangelicals in particular tend just you know, not to believe in climate change, and they're such an important part of the Republican electorate that if they can be it's one thirty. If they can be reached and moved, then that could really help to shift the politics of climate change in the United States. Thank you. Sorry? I said thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'm a little familiar with Ecuador. It's fairly mountainous, right? And, and so that whole area is. Well, it's, it's, I'm thinking of it as people going up and down mountains all the time, and, and, and doesn't that make it very difficult for traveling, and, 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 and how do you reach? I mean, that sounds like when you went within a valley and all that other stuff. I mean, does that make it hard to get around? Um, well, the, the, um, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of road construction in Ecuador. They have oil, and a lot of the oil money has gone to, to improving the road system. Um, so, I don't know, was it hard to get around? Did you guys feel it was hard to get around? Um, you were in the dark. Was that? <laughs> you were in the dark oil field. <laughs> I was going to say the thing that I thought was impressive though was the bus systems and how we get around yeah, different yeah. towns. Yeah, yeah, they have a great bus system. It's very cheap. And yeah, in fact, so, uh, I'm wondering if you came across anyone um, uh, within the community there in Ecuador that was in denial, or was everybody just across the board like? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say that everybody necessarily, you know, has a keen understanding of climate change. And in fact, um, one of the people I interviewed was, is the um, president, uh, I'm trying to remember, he's the so president of the sort of political arm of the evangelical movement. And, and um, it's, it's not an issue that, that at the level of the evangelical organizations they've really taken on. So some of the leaders are aware of it and think that they should, others not so much. The guy that we interviewed um, is one of the more conservative leaders and uh, it wasn't, isn't really aware of climate change. It's not that he's, it's not that he's denying it, um, I mean I think, I'm trying to remember, you know, I, I think, you know, if, as I drew him out, he Probably, I think he said something like, you know, yeah, sure, the climate is changing. But he wasn't really aware of it as an issue. Um, so I, I don't think anybody's in denial, but the other, but there are, there were people that said, you know, this is what was, uh, it's a fulfillment of the biblical prophecies. It's the end times. And uh, in fact, some of the same people, one, one, one guy in particular I'm remembering, who was very outspoken, he said, you know, it's our responsibility to address it and to care for God's creation because God left us in charge, uh, and that's a genesis and all of that. So that's one perspective, and, and he, he, that, that he thinks that that's true. And also, there's the, what he called the prophetic perspective, which is that, uh, 
God told us that there were going to be plagues and rains and disasters and floods and all, and that's what we see happening. And, um, you know, but, but that didn't stop him from saying that people also ha are responsible for acting. Did you want to follow up? our role in, in, in the U.S. or in other countries as far as um, polluting or... Yeah, so I mean I think most people in Ecuador, most of the people that I talk to um, have some understanding that, well first of all, it's pretty obvious to most people that the climate is changing because they can look at the mountain and I mean, in, in the pictures here I guess there have been, I think there have been some snowfall but the ice itself is is receding and often you'll see the mountain um, bare rock where it didn't used to be bare rock. Um, they're they're uh, aware that they can't depend on the rains and the dry season anymore in the way that they used to. So it's pretty obvious to most farmers, even you know, without a formal education or anything, that the climate has changed. They have also, I think, for the most part, heard that there's some connection to people contaminating the earth, to people not taking care of it well. Beyond that, I don't think they necessarily have a good understanding of exactly how and why and where and, and of the fact that the industrialized countries are more responsible than, you know, than the poorer countries or stuff like that. Um, I, I would say that's about the level. You said that malaria has increased due to climate change? Well, In some parts of the world, yeah. Um, what is the direct relationship? Well, so uh, in Ecuador and in the East African highlands where, where I was talking about, um, the higher you go uh, in altitude, the cooler it gets, yeah. right? right. But, but if it's warming everywhere, then, then the line goes up. In other words, you know, so, so if the malarial, the, 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 the mosquitoes that carry malaria only survive up to a certain temperature, then that range is, is going up. And you see the same things in Ecuador, the, the, the same upward shift in terms of crop zones. So in the place where I was a Peace Corps volunteer a long time ago, um, they can't grow fava beans anymore. It's just too low. So it, it always rots. They can grow fava beans up a little bit higher in the mountains. But they used to be able to grow fava beans there. Now um, they can grow things that are more tropical crops that they could never grow there before. But, you know, it's, everything is just shifting upward because of climate change. In the back. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, because one of your, your like, main target audience are white American evangelicals. Yeah. And um, just, I know that uh, your um, interviewees are um, uh, evangelical converts and, and they believe in, in uh, the Bible and use that as evidence of climate change, but also in general indigenous peoples and, and those that live in the global south kind of have a stronger connection with the, with the environment and like interact with nature a little bit more. And so I'm wondering if that's also just kind of a little bit of, in, of like an influence of why they have a stronger connection to um, advocating for climate change, just because maybe historically or like culturally they're more in tune with nature, so to say. Um, and then like kind of offshooting off of that, have you considered um, also seeking out um, evangelicals in kind of the other parts of the Western world besides Canada to um, gain more white advocates? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that just occurred to me, and I just uh, kind of said, I mean, initially my idea was okay, I'm a specialist on Ecuador. Let's broaden that to Latin America and the Caribbean. I speak Spanish, I speak Kish, I speak English. Um, and then I said, well, you know, there are other places in the world, in the global south, so let me broaden it a little more. And I guess I just kind of got to a point where I said, if I'm going to take on the whole world, it's, it's going to be pretty 
hard to hard to manage. And um, but yeah, I mean, I could see the I could see the logic of that. Um, in re in response to your first question about kind of connections to the land. Um, I think in some ways you could say that for like some of the people that we filmed in Ecuador, um, maintain a kind of Andean ideas about Mother Earth, or in the case of the people living up near the mountains, some of them will still will talk about the mountain in kind of traditional Indian terms as like an animate being. Type the Chimborazo, Father Chimborazo. Um, but I, I would hesitate. I, I, I would hesitate to assume that the folks on Tangier Island, for example, have less of a sense of connection to their land, or evangelical farmers in Iowa, or mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would would generalize that there's a, you know, such a stark difference necessarily. Um, one of the things that people who study uh, opinion on climate change say is that, um, something that someone advised me early on was to say that pastors who have some, who hunt, or who have some other connection to the outdoors, who can't are often particularly more responsive to climate change messages. So you know, people here, some, some, some even U.S. evangelicals too, might may well feel a, a strong connection to to nature. Did, did you know yeah. what? Um, were you greeted with open arms when you came to these villages, or did you have to do some convincing and to let them? share their stories and what the, the, um, how they feel about the threat level of the climate as well? Uh, it wasn't hard at all to get people talking about climate change. Um, you always, you know, of course, you have to introduce yourself to people that, that you don't know. Um, I, my previous work was with uh, Catholic indigenous people. I had some, you know, people who knew people and so forth. But I had a, a meeting with a, a group of evangelical pastors and told them about the project and, um, you know, and then several of them invited us to, to their villages. I mean, that's what I was asking for. Um, one of the places that we filmed was the same valley where I worked 25 years ago and people there brought out the... Um, brought out first the, the bread and the tea and then the, um, the, the trago, the, the sugar cane liquor and the guitar, well, in the Catholic community, not the evangelicals. But, um, uh, you know, and, and, and through a party, basically. So, um, yeah, people, uh, people open their doors to us everywhere. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's thank him for a wonderful